Hello everyone, welcome back to Microsoft Flight Sim 2020, where I'm going to take a look at a newly released freeware plane available on flightsim.to. This is the de Havilland DH-88 Comet from Shepper. It is new to uh, Flight Sim 2020, even though this plane appeared in Flight Sim 9. Uh, this is not like a conversion from Flight Sim 9 or anything like that. This was made especially for this version of Flight Sim. And it is fairly well detailed actually for a, flight sim, uh, for a freeware plane. And the plane itself is one that I was hoping to get. Uh, in fact, when they announced the 40th anniversary edition, they had the Wright Flyer, the Spirit of St. Louis, and stuff like that, DC-3. Those were planes that were part of Flight Sim 9, the uh, Century of Flight edition. And this was also one of those planes. And I was hoping maybe they were going to sneak it in uh, to the 40th anniversary edition, but that was a long shot because it's not quite as popular as those more obvious choices. But uh, here we have a very good freeware version, uh, so I'm quite happy about that. Uh, the original plane flew in the McRobertson Air Race from England to Australia and won it. Uh, so we have five liveries, including uh, I think two that actually flew in that race. So yeah, uh, we have potentially a 2,500 nautical mile range and a 12 hour endurance if you can last that long. So now on the... On the page at flightsim.to, they said that uh, they have tried to make it as realistic as possible, including some very interesting <laughs> aspects of the realism that we'll get to once we fly it. But on the page, it said that you uh, to check before each flight, you have no more than 50% fuel in the front fuel tank, uh, center one. And, uh, well, uh, that would be sad because that would limit our range, right? So what I'm going to do, uh, uh, we can see here we meet the maximum takeoff weight here, but the center of gravity is uh, a little bit too far forward. So what I'm going to do is I, I will drain it until it's happy. And also our uh, payload mass with both pilot and co-pilot are okay. So I'll make that concession. And this is uh, 94. I, I want to see if it can fly. Uh, this heavy. Flightsim.to said this is more than enough for three hours of flight. I don't want three hours of flight. I intend to see if we can uh, if we can fly potentially for 12 hours. I'm not going to actually fly for 12 hours, but we should have enough fuel to fly for uh, maybe 12 hours, and I want to see that happen. So, and the reason that they wanted us to limit the uh, front fuel tank is because of horrible ground handling because of poor CG. Well, you know, if that's how the plane was, that's how the plane was. I mean, I'm used to tail draggers having horrible ground handling, so we'll see how it goes. And then there's the gyroscopic drift thing. It was another warning, but we won't be flying so far that that's going to be a problem. I didn't actually want to go to wherever the heck that is. Uh, we will go from uh, Milden Hall, which is where they actually started the McRobertson Air Race, and we'll just head to London for our first test flight, and we'll see how we do. Um, it's gotta be hard to land with it, with this much fuel, uh, admittedly. That is obviously going to be a struggle. But anyway, it'll be a good solid test flight, I think. Yeah, the race time was 70 hours, 54 minutes and 18 seconds with Grosvenor House uh, on the air race. It was, of course, multiple legs. Well, um, there's a heck of a cloud right in front of us from the looks of things. So this is what the copy looks like. It's a wood paneled and we can actually see our co-pilot in the back there. Um, we might want to change the model of that, but I'm not going to fuss about that right now. Um, little bucket seats and you can see the instruments. Uh, fairly simple instruments, but it's not horrible looking in here at least. Uh, the exterior looks pretty good. Very smooth though. But otherwise, at least, it is looking the part. That's a heck of a light on the nose. It's like Rudolph. Anyway, so, yeah. Uh, but the weather is formidable here, from the look of things. We will see how it goes. So, we are overloaded, and uh, as the website says, you might want to fly it short of fuel if you want any sort of ground handling. But we'll, um, we'll go with what we have here, and I'll try and... 
Let me let me raise myself up so I can see the edges of the runway. Yeah. I haven't gotten to full throttle yet. I'm now at full throttle. It's not that bad actually. I've had worse. I mean, basically every uh, World War II fighter. <laughs> so yeah. No, no, it's not too bad with the full load actually. Now if we were trying to taxi, that's a whole other story. Tail draggers and taxiing. Fun. Now, that leads us to uh, one element of the realism, which is the time it takes to retract the landing gear. You see, on a racer like this, they didn't want to have heavy hydraulics or anything. So when I press the landing gear, you can see that uh, wheel to the right there, the red wheel, turning. And basically, they had to crank the landing gear up, and it took like five minutes. So the landing gear is coming up. It's just going to take a while. I really love the wing of the DH-88. The Comet has a very... It's, it's sort of like the taper and slight sweep back of the DC-3. But very pointed. Anyway, if I make a recommendation, maybe a bump map and... Uh, maybe some sign of very, very light wear. I don't mind it being sleek. After all, it's a racer and everything, but um, otherwise everything is great. Yep, that wheel's still going to be turning for a while. Glad to have a fuel gauge. But uh, the manifold pressure gauge doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. The manifold pressure ga gauge seems reversed. That's me at the top of the throttle range, and then as I go down, the manifold pressure seems to indicate that it's going up, which is, isn't how the manifold pressure normally works, as far as I know. So, yeah, I'm a bit confused about the manifold pressure there. Yep, yep, that landing gear is continuing to go up very, very slowly there, you can see. Pretty nice. Well, the RPM just went down for some reason. I'm wondering if I was push pushing the engine too hard. Well, uh, bringing down the propeller pitch seems to increase the RPMs, so okay. That's not how I normally think of propeller pitch, but if it works, it works. This plane did not go particularly fast. Uh, tops out at just under 200 miles an hour. It was more about its range, the fact that it could last 12 hours, which, you know, normally when you look at a plane like this, you don't expect it to be able to fly for 12 hours. The scenery is looking really good, I must say. What's really remarkable is how slick they made the plane. It'd be interesting to have a version with upgraded engines to see what it could do, because you know, I don't imagine that it's, uh, it's very draggy. It's not got one of those big radials up front. Another plane of the era, the Hughes H1, would be interesting to have. Uh, it did have a radial up front, but it was fast. Another racer. Had, with a longer wing option, a fair bit of range. Actually more range than this. That was notoriously difficult to fly. So we should be by Stansted now. Stansted. It's... Oh there it is. So Stansted Airport EGSS. I'm gonna have to remember to put the gear down early, huh? Gotta give it like five minutes. Yep, everything looking really good as far as the scenery is concerned. All looking very spiffy around here. This runway ahead of us is North Wheeled, EGSX. Okay, this is Epping, 
Thanks to Lawson. And we have. We see it to our left. Should be Stapleford somewhere over there. And we're getting pretty close to London, so I'm gonna drop the landing gear, or start dropping the landing gear. The wheel is turning again. Of course, while our landing gear is coming down, we can take a look at London. Do a quick London tour as usual. And there's London. Uh, this program tree over here could do with some work. But I've got the Orbix London scenery too, so it all competes for resources. Well, and you're still coming down. I don't know, are, do cruise lighters come up the Thames? Alright, taking a quick look over here. Oh, do I dare do it? I don't know. I don't know how all this fits. This is probably a bad idea. Um, uh, we went through! We went through! Went through London Bridge, or Tower Bridge, whatever you want to call it. Did this time. Missed it with the Spitfire, I know. People complained. Okay, I better uh, avoid smacking into any buildings, you know. After having that little bit of fun, we need to still keep, keep ourselves safe now. I think the landing gear must be down. Well, let's make sure to see Big Ben and everything over here. Okay, check inside. Yeah, the wheels stopped turning. Alright, time to go around and head back towards London City Airport. This is a very easy plane to fly, I'll tell you. I do expect to use a little bit of aileron or rudder trim. But other than that... This is the normal position in the cockpit. I think you'd pretty much always want to be in the higher position. Well, we went through the tower bridge and didn't really see the environs very well at the time. Tower of London looking pretty convincing. In theory, the stall speed of this is 64 knots, but I have no idea what fuel load that's measured with. So, yeah, which would make a huge difference. Since the maximum takeoff weight is nearly double the empty weight. It didn't sense a whole lot of drag from the wheels. Oh, I wonder. I, I feel like there's some invisible flaps. You see how I've suddenly started nosing down? But we don't really see flaps. Now I'm gonna try and lower flaps. You see how I, I'm not touching the stick. It's, it suddenly starts going up. So I think there's some invisible flaps configured on this. So keep that in mind. We basically had flaps down the whole way. <laughs> I think. If I had uh, HUD instruments instrument display out here we'd probably be able to tell better 
But now I've got two notches of flaps down, which is basically what it had on takeoff, presumably. So, yeah, keep that in mind. We don't seem to have our flaps visibly deploying. I don't even know if this was supposed to have flaps. It does have a flaps lever. Let's see. Yeah, that's two notches of flaps. But I don't really see them deploy. So that's one little quirk. Be aware of that. So we could have been going much faster than we were. We just had flaps down. It's all right. Uh, we got a good look at the scenery and everything. Still hard to see where the heck the runway is. Uh, I'm I'm oh, I'm on a taxiway or something. Oh shoot! I nose down. Maybe that's what they meant by bad ground handling when uh, when we've got a lot of fuel in the forward fuel tank. I think that must be it. So yeah, when flying this, make sure that at least on touchdown, you drain the forward fuel tank. You've used enough of that fuel so that you can touch down without nosing down like that. I think you definitely want the fuel further back. So uh, yeah, not the not the greatest success ever on this flight, but I think uh, yeah. So just get that that back over there and it should be a little bit better to land with it though i wasn't doing a particularly good job on landing anyway but first try with a tail dragger you know how it is so that was the de Havilland dh88 comet freeware available from flightsim.to i'll link it in the video description and with that i'll say thank you for watching i hope you enjoyed this video if you did please do press like if you have any comments or suggestions please leave them in the comment section below and i'll see you next time